अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल That was uh, Sadhu Om singing verse 9 of Sri Arunachakram Malai along with the refrain. Um, that is the verse that I'm going to be talking about today. What Bhagavan says in this verse is, Ene eritippo dene kalavabidil iduvo anmai arunachala. If we split that uh, into separate words, it's ene aritu. Uh, Ipodu ene kalabhabidil iduvo anmai arunachala. That uh, literally means arunachala, if not now uniting me, destroying me, is this manliness. The um, Bhagavan always expresses these things very uh, in the, he expresses the maximum in the fewest words. So to bring out the implication, we can slightly expand it. Um, what that implies is, Arunachala, now that I'm willing to surrender myself to you, that's the significance of the word now, it implies, but now when I'm in this ripe state, when I'm complete, when I'm fully willing to uh, surrender myself entirely to you, if you do not unite me with yourself in inseparable oneness, thereby destroying me, um, and destroying me also uh, indirectly implies, uh, in the context, destroying my virginity, that is, nam namely ego. Is this your manliness? Um, so that is the meaning of the verse. Um, uh, Arunachala is Purushottama, the supreme person or the supreme man, the man par excellence. And uh, his anma, his manliness, is his arrow shakti, the power of his grace. And the ultimate aim and function of his grace is the destruction of ego. Therefore, by asking rhetorically, Idavo Anmai, Arunachala, is this your manliness, Arunachala? Bhagavan is urging Arunachala to show the full power of his grace by destroying ego and then by making him eternally and inseparably one with himself. Um, the word an uh, means male or man, and the suffix may denotes an abstract quality, uh, condition or state, like ness in English. So uh, an may, but the basic meaning of an may is maleness or manliness, but it also implies all qualities associated with manliness, such as virility, courage, strength and power. Therefore, since the power of Arunachala is his grace, and since grace is his very nature, in this context, Anmai, manliness, is a metaphor for grace, which is the power of his infinite love. Uh, idu means this, and Iduvo is an interrogative form of this. So it means is this. Therefore, Iduvo Anmai is a question that means, is this your manliness? And in this context, is this your manliness implies, is this your grace? Which is the same question that he asked Arunachala in verse 6, where he uh, sang, Iduvo an my, uh, sorry, Iduvo unadaro Arunachala, is this your grace? So the, uh, in both cases, the question is the same. The question implies the same. The wording is different, but the implication is the same. And as in that verse 6, in this verse, Bhagavan is rebuking Arunacha by asking this question. But his rebuking is an indirect way of pleading with him to complete the work of his grace by annihilating him completely. 
that this is his intention is made clear in the conditional clause with which he begins this verse, namely, ene aritu ipodu ene kalavavidel, which means if you if you do not now unite me with yourself, thereby destroying me. Ene means me, and in this context it refers to ego. Aritu is an adverbial participle that means destroying or annihilating. So ene aritu uh, means uh, destroying me or annihilating me, thereby implying eradicating ego in such a way that it can never rise again. As Bhagavan indicated in the first verse, Arunachala mena ahame nine pava ahateve rarupai Arunachala. Arunachala, you will eradicate the egos of those who think deep within the heart or mind, but Arunachala is actually I. Um, eradication of ego is the sole aim of this love song, and eradicating it is the very nature of Arunachala. So this is what he is implicitly praying for in this verse when he sings, Ene Aritu, destroying me. Then the next word is a very significant word, Ipodu. Ipodu means now, at this very moment. Which exp- So this word uh, expresses how eagerly, urgently and intensely he is pining for his own annihilation. Now that he is willing to surrender himself entirely without the least reservation to Arunachala, Arunachala need not and should not delay even for a moment, but should annihilate him immediately, thereby making him one with himself. Only when we are willing to surrender ourselves immediately without a moment's delay or hesitation are we truly pakva. Pakva means ripe, mature or well-cooked. So uh, only when we're ready to surrender ourselves here and now at this very moment, are we truly pakva enough to be swallowed by him. That is, he will only uh, swallow the well-cooked, the perfectly ripe uh, soul. Um, so, but when when the when our willingness to surrender ourselves is complete, is when we have don't have a moment of hesitation to give ourselves entirely to him now, then we are truly ripe, and then we are fit to be swallowed by him. Um, And this was clearly demonstrated by Bhagavan on that day in Madurai, when an intense fear of death suddenly arose in his heart. He did not wait to think about it, or to consult others, or to read any book, but immediately turned his mind inwards to see what this awareness that shines as I actually is. What dies is the body. So leaving it as a corpse, he looked deep within himself to see what happens to the awareness eye when the body dies. And thus he saw that in its pure and pristine condition, eye remains as it always is without being affected in the least by the appearance or disappearance of the body or anything else. In other words, by looking deep within to see who am I, ego subsides and merges back into the pure eye like a river merging in the ocean, thereby losing its ego nature and remaining as its real nature. Losing our ego nature is what Bhagavan refers to in this verse as ene aritu, uh, de- destroying me, and merging back into the pure eye as the pure eye, which is our nature, is what is he, he refers to as in a uh, kalatal, uh, uniting me, that implies uniting me with yourself or absorbing me into yourself. Kalavabidal is a negative conditional form of uh, either kala or kalavu. These are two verbs, but actually they mean the same. They come from the same root. Um, it's two slightly different forms of the same verb, um, which means... Um, to mix, unite, join, combine, absorb, blend, amalgamate, or copulate, and which in a spiritual context is often used to refer to the soul being absorbed in God. So, in, uh, so kalavabidil uh, means if not uniting or if not absorbing. 
any color barbido therefore literally means if not uniting me or if not absorbing me. And in this context, it implies if you do not unite me with yourself or if you do not absorb me into yourself. When ego is annihilated, what remains is only our natural, who is the real nature of ourself, Atma Swarupa. So annihilation of ego and being absorbed in him are not two distinct processes, but one and the same. That is, it's just two different ways of describing the same thing. Um, because what makes us seem separate from him is only this ego. When ego is destroyed, the, the illusory appearance of separation, of separateness, is destroyed, and we remain as one with him. This is what is metaphorically described as uniting with him. Actually, we never unite with him because we're always one with him. So it's not a matter of two separate things joining together, but it is it is like the, like a, a, a one analogy Bhagavan uses in um in Arunachala um uh, Pancharatnam is like a river merging in the ocean. The river is never actually separate from the ocean. That is, where did the water of the river come from? It comes only from the ocean. It had evaporated and it uh, had risen up as clouds and it uh, had poured as rains on the mountain and it uh, formed a river and it returns to its source. So the river merging in the ocean is simply the, the seemingly separate water of the river merging back in its source. And, but it is never actually anything other than the water of which the ocean is con, um, composed. Likewise, we are never anything other than our natural. But by rising as ego, we see we've taken on certain limitations, so we seem to be separate from him. Um, so, as I say, the, the annihilation of ego and being absorbed in him are one and the same thing. We cannot be absorbed in him or united with him without ego thereby being annihilated. And ego cannot be annihilated without our thereby being absorbed in and united with him. That is, he is such it, pure being awareness, which is what exists and shines as our own fundamental awareness I am. Whereas ego is the false adjunct conflated awareness, I am this body which is therefore called chit jada granti. Uh, uh, granti means the uh, knot, and uh, so it implies the knot formed by the semi entanglement of pure awareness chit uh, uh, with a body, uh, uh, which is non-aware. Um, ego is therefore a mixture of what is real and hence permanent and unchanging, namely I am, and what is unreal and hence impermanent and constantly changing, namely a set of adjuncts called body, which is a form composed of five sheaths. The five sheaths being the, the physical form of the body, the life that animates it, and the mind, intellect, and will that function within it. These are what Bhagavan collectively refers to as body. So when he says ego is the false awareness, I am this body, he means ego is that which that I, but it uh, always identifies with itself with a set of five sheaves. But these five sheaves are not what we actually are. What we actually are is only the pure I am. So Arunachala, who is that pure I am, is therefore the reality of ego. So when ego is destroyed or annihilated, its adjunct cease to exist, and what remains is only its reality, the pure awareness I am. And hence, this is the state in which he absorbs us entirely, uh, making us inseparably one with himself. That is, when we, when Bhagavan talks about annihilation of ego, it, only what is unreal in the ego can be destroyed, namely the adjuncts. What is real, I am, remains as it is. So when the adjuncts are, um, are destroyed, the, pu the pure awareness I am, which is the sole reality of ego, alone remains. That is like when a, um, when a, uh, an ornament is melted, a gold ornament, if it's melted, it loses its form 
it ceases to be a ring or a bangle or a necklace or whatever it is, but the substance remains the same. It still remains gold. So the substance of ego is I am, the pure awareness I am. The, the adjuncts are merely the, the form which ego assumes. So the ego without form, without the adjuncts, is the pure awareness I am. So by so by the destruction of ego, that means destruction of a form of uh, 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 adjuncts, but uh, but uh, uh, form ego. What remains is the substance, the pure awareness I am, and that is Arunachala. Arunachala is always uh, ready to eradicate ego and thereby make us one with himself, but he will not do so until we are willing to give ourselves to him wholly and without the least reservation. That Bhagavan was so willing is implied by his use of the word ipodu now, at this very moment. So by using this word here, he is teaching us that our love to be one with Arunachala must be so intense and wholehearted, but we are willing to be annihilated by him at this very moment without any further delay. Therefore, if we have not yet lost ourselves entirely in him, that shows that we do not yet have sufficient love to surrender ourselves wholly to him here and now. How then are we to cultivate and strengthen the love to be annihilated by him? This is ultimately the work and responsibility of his grace. Because whatever love we now have to surrender ourselves to him was sown as a seed and has been carefully nurtured in our heart by his grace. And his grace will not stop nurturing it until it has become so intense and all-consuming that we are finally willing to submit ourselves to being annihilated by him immediately. However, though his grace alone, it, though it is his grace alone that can nurture this love in our heart, grace works through us. It, it does so through us because it is our own real nature. Atmosarupa. So until we lose ourselves entirely in him, we have to play our part by trying patiently and persistently to be self-attentive. That is, sometimes people ask, which is important, which is necessary, uh, grace or effort? As Bhagavan explained, this is a fundamental misunderstanding because the very effort that we make to turn within is itself the working of grace. So uh, grace works through us by making us make the effort to turn within. So whatever effort we make to turn within is entirely by his grace. So it is not grace or effort. It is grace working in the form of effort, working through us in the form of effort. Um, by being self-attentive, we are giving ourselves wholly to him. Uh, as Bhagavan teaches us in the first sentence of the 13th paragraph of Nana, in which he says, Anna chintane tabira, vera chintane kalamba vidaku, satram idum kodamal, atmanishta paranai irapade, tanai isanaku alipadam. That means being atmanishta paran. Atmanishta paran means one who is firmly fixed as oneself giving not even the slightest room to the rising of any chintana, any thought, except Atma chintana. Atma chintana literally means thought of oneself. It implies self-contemplation or self-attentiveness. That alone is giving oneself to God. So the implication here is, uh, well, the main clause of this uh, sentence is, Atmanishta paranai iripte tanai isanaku alipadam. That means being Atmanishta paran alone is giving oneself to God. And then the adverbial clause with which the sentence starts, in, uh, um, being, uh, sorry, um, giving not even the slightest room to the rising of any thought except Atmachintana, that implies. But in, in order to be Atmanishta Paran, what we need to do is to cling to self-attentiveness so firmly, but we thereby give no room to rising of any other thought. Because thoughts can rise only if we attend to them. Because thoughts arise where? They arise only in our awareness. They cannot arise 
without our being aware of them. So it's only in our awareness that they arise. If we, instead of attending to the thoughts, if we attend to ourselves, we thereby give no room to the rising of any thoughts, not even to the rising of the first thought I. Thereby we remain as we actually are. That is being admonished apparent, and that alone is giving ourselves to God. In other words, the uh, nature of ego, as Bhagavan often explained, is to rise, stand, and flourish by attending to things other than itself, but to subside and dissolve back into its source by attending to itself. So it's only by attending to ourselves that we can give ourselves wholly to God. So the more we love to surrender ourselves, the more we will cling to self-attentiveness. And the more we cling to self-attentiveness, the more our love to surrender ourselves to him will grow. Um, the Nayaka Nayaki uh, allusion in this verse is very clear. Not only because Bhagavan asks in the main clause, Iduvo Anmai, is this your manliness, but also because he asks this immediately after saying, Ene Kalabhavidel, if you do not join or unite me with yourself. Since one of the meanings of the verb Kala is to join in carnal union. So this is a metaphor here. That one is using is, is a, it's an illusion, to, a metaphorical illusion to the to the uh, union of a man and woman. Um, so Arunachala is the beloved Lord Nayaka, the hero of this love story, and Bhagavan is a young maiden Nayaki, the heroine, whose heart he has stolen by entering her mind, which was her home, and enticing her to elope with him to the cave of uh, the heart, which is his home, and there he has been keeping her as a prisoner, as she sang in verse 3. In verse 3, what she sang is, Aham buhan dietun ahaguhe sirayai amavita dengol arunachala. That literally means arunachala entering the mind. That is, this word aham, means it can mean mind, it can mean home. So entering the mind or entering the home, uh, carrying away, uh, keeping captive in the cave of your heart is what? Uh, what that implies is, Arunachala, entering my mind or home, forcibly carrying me away, dragging me out or attracting me to yourself, you have been keeping me captive in the cave of your heart. What a wonder of your grace this is. However, he has not yet completed the task that he thus began. Disappointed by his delay, therefore, she began to fear that he may reject her. So in verse 4 she sang, Arunachala. Arunachala, for whom did you take charge of me? If rejecting, the whole world will blame. That means, for Ar Arunachala, for whom or for whose sake did you take charge of me? Did you take me as your own? I mean... If you reject or banish or abandon me, the whole world will blame or ridicule or revile you. Uh, therefore, in the next verse, verse 5, she pleaded with him, Ippari tapu une inine pittai inia biduva arunachala. Arunachala, escape this blame. Why did you make me think of you? Now who will leave? In other words, you cannot leave me or let go of me, and I cannot leave or let go of you. And then in the next verse, in verse 6, she rebuked him, appealing to his kind-heartedness. See the, the, the begging and pleading tone in all these verses. Though he's sometimes um, uh, uh, ridiculing or scolding Aranacha, he's doing so only out of heart-melting love. Because he wants that that union with him here and now. He wants to be destroyed here and now. So uh, in verse 6, she rebuked him, appealing to his kind-heartedness. So she's finding so many ways to, to, peer, uh, to, uh, to plead with him and to cajole him. Indridam unnail peridaral puribo iduvo unadaral aranachala. Aranachala, you who bestow kindness greater than the mother who gave birth. Is this your kindness? The word he uses here for kindness is uh, arul. Arul is means um, means grace 
or, or, or love, kindness, solicitude, or, or, or compassion. So uh, um, when we talk about a mother, we talk about her kindness, her love, her solicitude. When we talk about God, we talk about grace, but it amounts to the same thing. So Aranacha, who bestowed grace, greater than that given by the mother who gave birth to one, is this your grace? Um, since he did not respond to her prayers by joining her with him in inseparable union, she began to reflect on her own unworthiness, recognizing that her mind is recognizing that her mind was still running outwards, back towards her former life in the home where she was born, namely the world of physical and mental phenomena, and that by allowing her mind to run out run away towards other things, she was cheating on him in her heart. However, when he has taken charge of her as his own, surely it is his responsibility to be seated firmly on her mind and thereby not allow it to run outwards, to run anywhere. So in verse 7 she prayed, Uneye matri oda dulatinmel uludiai irupai aranachala. Arachala, may you be firmly on the mind so that it does not run deceiving you. That implies, Arachala, may you be or remain or sit down or be seated or be enthroned firmly on my mind so that it does not run out towards other things under the sway of its Vishaya Vasanas, deceiving or cheating on you like a promiscuous wife. Why does she still allow her mind to run outwards and roam about in the world under the sway of its old Vishaya Vasanas? When he has attracted her to himself and is keeping her so close, how does her former life in the world still hold any attraction for her? It is only because she has not yet been able to recognize and appreciate his beauty in all its fullness. So in verse 8, she beseeched him, Arunachala, so that seeing you uninterruptedly, the mind which roams about the world subsides, show your beauty. That is, the mind will subside, the mind will surrender itself completely only when it sees Arunachala uninterruptedly. And it will be attracted to see Arunachala uninterruptedly, only when he shows his true beauty. So what this verse implies is, so that seeing or looking at you uninterruptedly, my mind, which by its very nature roams incessantly about the world under the sway of its Vishaya Vasanas, so that this mind subsides or settles or submits or ceases entirely and forever in you, uh, thereby being brought under the sway of your grace. Now it's under the sway of Vasanas. If we surrender ourselves to him, it'll be brought under the sway of his grace. Show me your beauty. Your beauty here implies the infinite beauty of your real nature, which is unlimited, unalloyed, and unceasing happiness. So through through all these verses, we can see there's a continuity. Bhagavan is, is in so many ways praying for the same thing. Um, being unable to bear this tortuous state in which her mind still runs out towards the world and roams about under the sway of its Vishaya Vasanas, her longing to give herself entirely to him has now become so intense that she pleads with him not to wait a moment longer, but to unite her with, uh, with himself in inseparable oneness, thereby destroying her once and forever. Uh, Arunachala, now that I'm longing to give myself entirely to you, if you do not unite me with yourself in inseparable oneness, thereby destroying me, is this your manliness? As we have seen, ene aritu means destroying me. And in this context, I mean, in the context of this prayer, uh, by the fully ripe or spiritually mature maiden, namely Jiva, the soul, for complete union with her beloved Lord, namely Shiva, God, 
it implies destroying my virginity, in which virginity is a metaphor for jivatvam. Jivatvam means soulhood or individuality, the state of being a jiva, namely ego. In his uh, Poriparai, his explanatory paraphrase for this verse, therefore, Murugana paraphrases ene aritu, uh, destroying me, as en ahankara uh, kanimeye uh, arabe aritu. That means completely destroying my ego virginity, in which ahankara kanime, uh, uh, ego virginity, implies virginity which is ego. Just as destruction of her virginity is the price that a virgin must pay in order to be joined in carnal union with her beloved, destruction of its jivatvam is the price that the jiva must pay in order to be joined in eternal union with Shiva, who is its beloved Lord, Arunachala. In order to merge and thereby become one with the ocean, a river must give up its river nature, because so long as it remains as a river, it cannot be one with the ocean. Losing its river nature, however, is not actually a loss at all, because all it is losing is certain limitations. And by losing those limitations, it unites and remains one with the vast ocean. Likewise, destruction of ego is not a real loss, because by its destruction, all we are losing is our limitations. And by losing them, we remain as Arunachala, the one unlimited whole, which is what we always actually are. However, so long as ego, the false identification, I am this body, remains strong, destruction of ego seems to us to be the greatest loss of all. Even the death of the body seems to us to be a great loss, and hence we cling on to this body till its last breath no matter how much suffering and pain it may be causing us. But however strong our attachment to this body may be, sooner or later we'll be forced to let go of it. And when eventually that does happen, it turns out to be just the ending of a dream. The ending of a dream, however, is not the ending of the dreamer. So sooner or later, the dreamer will again begin dreaming another dream. Therefore, the death of whatever body we now take to be ourself is a very trivial loss because it will, be it will be replaced by another body, like an old worn out shirt being replaced by a new one. That's a beautiful analogy uh, given by Krishna, I think, in the second chapter of Gita. That, 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 um, the death of one body is it just like taking off an old worn out shirt because um, in order to replace it with a new one. Um, this state of dreaming one dream after another will go on indefinitely until the dreamer, namely ego, is willing to surrender itself entirely, thereby allowing itself to be destroyed by the infinite light of pure awareness, I am, which is the manliness or grace of Arunachala. It is only after countless dreams, however, that the dreamer will eventually gain the extreme maturity, pakva, to be wholeheartedly willing to embrace its own destruction. Though we will each eventually gain such maturity, we will do so only after dreaming countless lives. So among the countless jivas or souls we see in this world, those who are willing to embrace their own destruction at this very moment are very rare indeed. A few among those countless jivas may be coming close to gaining that required maturity. But even among those few, how many are actually willing to be destroyed now at this very moment without even a moment of further delay? Very, very rare indeed are such jivas. And the foremost among them was the young boy Venkaraman, whose yearning for his own destruction was so intense that at the age of 16, he cried out in his heart to Arunachala, Ene aritu ipodu, ene kalabavidil, iduvo an my Arunachala. Arunachala, destroying me now, if you do not unite me with yourself in inseparable oneness, is this your... Is this your manliness? How could Arunachala refuse such a heartfelt prayer? 
Therefore, he destroyed him then and there, consuming him in the fire of his jnana, pure awareness, and thereby making him one with himself. What then shone through the body, but was formerly the abode of Venkta Raman, was Arunachal himself in the form of Bhagavan Ramana. As Bhagavan Ramana, therefore, Arunachal later sang this love song to himself, expressing in words all the love and longing that was previously shining wordlessly in the extremely pure heart of Venkta Raman, the foremost among all his devotees. Though he seems to taunt himself in this verse by asking, Iduvo an my Aranachala, is this your manliness, Aranachala? These are words of love spoken by the lover to her beloved out of her intense yearning to be one with him. So we should not misconstrue them to mean that Aranachala could ever actually be anything other than manly. Because as we saw above, Anmay manliness is here a metaphor for, power, metaphor for the power of his grace, which is the power of his infinite silence, and which is therefore his very nature. That is, Arunachra is Shiva, God, and grace is his Shakti power. But since he and his power, Shiva and Shakti, are indivisibly one, his grace is none other than he himself. He himself is grace, and grace itself is he. Therefore, he can never fail to be gracious. So as soon as we are willing to give ourselves entirely to him, he will certainly destroy us and thereby make us one with himself. He is always willing to destroy us. Indeed, that is all he has ever wanted. So all that is now lacking is our willingness to be destroyed by him. However, the fact that we have been attracted to this path of self-investigation and self-surrender taught by him shows that he has already sown the seed of such willingness in our heart, and as having sown it, he is certainly nurturing it. Nevertheless, though he is doing everything necessary to help him, by his grace we must also try our best to help ourselves by constantly looking back within to see who am I thereby willingly sinking back into the cave of our heart, the source from which we have risen, which is where he is always residing, like an old lion waiting to devour us as soon as we enter. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Arana Chalaramanaya